Hi, everybody. I am going to talk about our paper with the topic SSBEP EEG signal classification based on Emotive Epoch BCI and Raspberry Pi. My name is Carla Villas Mendoza, and I am a current mechatronic engineer student at SPOI. I am in my last semester. And my fellows for the paper were Victor Sansa, Hector Trivino, Felix Rosales, Yamil Torres, Francis Loaiza, Enrique Pelaez, Ricardo Cajo, and Raquel Tinoco, who was in charge of collecting all the data for the project. This is the content that we are going to review today. First, we're doing the introduction, then the data set, the methodology, the results, and the conclusions. For the introduction, according to OMS, over a billion people live with some form of disability. This is about 15% of the world's population, and it is a big number that we have to take into account when doing this type of research. We had several motivations to start this project. One of the main motivations was um, that we wanted to do a first approach for a low cost de device capable of processing EEG signals in real time to control an external actuator. Could be a wheelchair or a robotic arm among others. We wanted to make it affordable and we wanted to improve response time. We also wanted the visual stimuli to come from a mobile device. And we had also several challenges. Our, our first challenge was that we had to achieve high accuracy with low computational cost. We wanted to also to make a good accuracy with a faster pre-processing and classification time. And also the light of the mobile device was not as intense as the one in light bulbs. Some experiments use um, light bulbs as visual stimuli instead of flashing lights coming from the screen, as we did. In the related works, some of the are steady state of above potential or SSBEP. It's a type of evoked potential that is produced by a visual stimuli flashing at a certain frequency, it could be between six to, six to 60 or six to 75 hertz, it depends. But for the challenges, um, EEG data has a high error rate and it's highly noise susceptible. For example, a blink, a small movement of the scalp or hair or adipose tissue can cause noise. The data set. For the data set, we wanted to thank the Technical University of Machala or Woodmatch. Um, the team in charge of Raquel Fino Coegas was the one that collected all the data. And you can find the data set in Dataport with the link that I provide here. For the experiment, 20 adult subjects were recruited between the age of 20 to 35. The staff avoided wearing brightly colored clothes that could distract the objects. The staff also respected the COVID secure, security measures. The temperature of the room was about 25 degrees Celsius. Um, the noise was between 30 to 55 decibels. And the participants signed an informed consent before participating in the project. We acquired all the data using the Emotive Epoch X. It has 14 electrodes with two ground references and it follows the international 1010 EEG system. It also has a um, sampler, sampler frequency of 128 Hertz. And we use a conductive jail that we buy here in Ecuador to reduce impedance between the electrodes and the scalp. For the visual stimuli designing, we use MATLAB 2020 and Psych Toolbox. Psych Toolbox is an open source library that you can find online. It helps you to design your own uh, experiment and the way that you want that your visual stimuli to show. In this case, we use squares flashing at different frequencies. I will, I will show you that later. And it also helps you to use um, precise timing when doing experiments of, of this this time this type of experiments you require precise timing so Psych2Looks is a library that helps you with that you can check it online 
For the data recording, we use the Amateur Fedbook headset and the Amateur Pro app. For the preprocessing um, stage, we use Python and Pandas, and for the classification, we used Scikit-learn. The experimental methodology that we used was, as I told before, we used the squares uh, placed on the top, bottom, right, and left of the screen. Each square flashed at a different frequency, and we had a resting tab, as we can see here, with a cross between a circle. That was our baseline data. The tasks um, were duration was 3.5 seconds, and the frequency tasks were shown 40 times each. When a frequency task was being shown, the other squares turned opaque by 80%, and we worked with frequencies over the frequencies 7, 9, 11, and 13 hertz. The way that we um, acquired all the data was we um, placed the Amateur Network headset in the subject tip. This headset communicated through Bluetooth with, with its own app, Amateur Pro app uh, that we had in our computer. Then in this app, you could configure the keys related with its own label. So for example, the key Q was related with label one, which was related with the class seven hertz and so on as uh, I showed you in the table. So the MATLAB software was in charge of send the trigger or the virtually pressed key to the Amateur Pro app. So whenever a task started, MATLAB sent the trigger so the Amateur Pro app could, um, could put the label in when the task started. So that way we could identify that, okay, this data was for the class 7 hertz, and this data was for the class 9 hertz. And also the MATLAB software was in charge of showing the visual stimuli in the screen. For the data preprocessing, we used only the occipital region of the brain, although we collected the data of all the electrodes. We focused mainly, we only used the data from electrodes occipital 1 and occipital 2. The M2 Pro app exported a CSV file for each subject. So at the end, we had 20 CSV files, and these files were divided into several files containing a temporary window each. So let's see, I just, let's see the image. This is a single file for a subject, and the ones that the, the data gathered in the label one as I said before, was related to the class 7 hertz. So this is a temporary window. Then the data with baseline, um, that is the label 5, is another temporary window, and so on and so on. And these files were split into folders representing their respective frequencies. So this temporary window is from the class 7 hertz, so it'd be here in the folder 7 hertz. This class is baseline, so it would go in the baseline folder. Then when all the data was organized, we also used a Butterworth filter of order 20 and with frequency limit of 5 to 30 hertz. Also, we extracted the outliers from the data. For the data augmentation, we decided that we had to use to use it because uh, our results were not as good as we expected to be. So we decided to use data augmentation. And what is data augmentation is, um, in this case, for, for EEG data, we used white noise of different amplitudes. So what is white noise? It's randomly generated arrive values added to the signal. So it doesn't lose the general behavior, but the values do change. So for example, in the picture on the left, you can see the original data in the, with a blue color. And the data with white noise added, added is the pointing line with um, color orange. So you can see that the behavior is the same, but you can clearly see that there is a difference um, in both graphs. But it's not a notable difference because the white noise had a small amplitude. 
but in the picture on the right, you can clearly notice the difference between the two graphs. And this is because the white noise had a big amplitude. Then we extracted features. We extracted exactly 21 features. Um, I, I use this image to show you how the feature extraction CSV file would look like. Of course, it had more columns, but it looks, it looks something like this. We use several features like mean, median, variance, peak frequency, mean frequency, amplitude histogram, etc. For the data and normalization, we use scikit-learn mean max scalar. First, we normalize our training data and save the minimum and maximum values of it. Then with those minimum and maximum values, we normalize the validation and the tasting data. For the, for the classifiers that we used, we used five classifiers, the support vector machine or SVM, the multilayer perceptron or MOP, the random forest or RF, the K nearest, uh, nearest neighbors or KNN, and extreme gradient boosting or XG boost. Our results. First, I'm going to talk about what each um, value described there means. So um, let's see, the recall is how good a test is at detecting the positive values. The precision is how many of the positively classified are more relevant. And the specificity is how good a test is at avoiding false alarms. So as I said before, first we tried our data without data augmentation and the highest accuracy that we obtained was from random forest and from MOP, uh, which, ha which had 54 and 52% respectively. And then we decided to um, use data augmentation in order to increase um, the training data. So the accuracy were 58% for random forest and 57% for XG boost. We can clearly see that the accuracy um, rise. And this was what we wanted. We wanted to discover the relationship between the amount of data that we um, put in our classifier and the accuracy that we had. So as we, um, as we increase the amount of data, the accuracy clearly um, also increased. And also one of the things that we wanted to check here is that we wanted to um, analyze each classifier individually. So as we advance in our project in the future, we could choose the classifiers that were more convenient for us. And for doing that, we also had to analyze the classification time of each classifier. So the classification times were um, relatively low, and the lowest was MLP and XG boost. So we concluded that XG boost may be the classifier that we wanted to work in the future with a classification time of 7.12 milliseconds. And it had uh, one of the highest accuracy um, that we had obtained, it was 57%. One of the conclusions is that without data augmentation, random forest and MOP had the higher accuracies with 54 and 52 respectively. And with data augmentation, we obtain accuracies of 58 and 57 from random forest and XG boost. And also that our data was, um, it existed an over adjustment in the classification algorithms due to the limited number of samples. And for later, for later um, projects, we want to implement real-time responses. And for doing that, we need shorter classification times. And as I said before, the 
classifiers that classify the data more quickly were MLP and XGBoost with times of 1.8 and 7.12 milliseconds. We also found out that we had to recruit more subjects to eliminate over adjustment in the algorithms. So this would be our next step in the project. Also as a recommendation, we, we suggest that you have, you have to have a, an adequate experimental design because clear data will help to improve the classification. And one of our biggest conclusions, and uh, this would be the next step definitely for us, is to try deep learning techniques because this type, this type of technique has been researched in the last few years. And it's one of the techniques that helps you to save a lot of time, especially in the preprocessing stage of the, of the experiment. And we wanted to also analyze the spectral images of the data. This is our information and thank you for having me here.